ourselves and our families, but for one another. I believe that taxes are like vegetables. They're like our Brussels sprouts. We don't necessarily want to pay them. We don't enjoy writing, uh, filing our taxes at the end of, of April every year, but they're a very important part of a healthy society and a healthy economy, and we need to remember that. My name is Trudy Bone, and I'm the Executive Director at the Social Planning Council of Kitchener-Waterloo. And we're a local charitable organization that works to stay aware of our community needs and its assets. And we work to share knowledge to help others with their problem solving and planning needs. And we work as often as is possible to collaborate with others to respond to the needs of the community so we can achieve together a healthy quality of life for all. We generally would say our mission is to cultivate community knowledge to advance social justice. We're hosting today's event in partnership with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives Ontario office as part of a province-wide book tour that's being hosted in partnership with the Canadian Centre and members of the Ontario Social Planning Network. The book we're featuring to launch our discussion today is Tax is Not a Four-Letter Word, a different take on taxes in Canada. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because the work we've done over many years suggests that we need to better understand the spending side of our tax system. And we need to talk about taxes because it sure does seem to be difficult to do. Today I want to thank the publisher of the book, WLU Press, a local enterprise, we'll say. It's my honour right now to introduce our guest speaker and our panellists. Dr. Alex Himmelfarb is the co-editor of the book Tax is Not a Four-Letter Word. He worked on this project with his son Jordan, who is the opinion editor at the Toronto Star. reflect a range of expertise, differing op opinions, and a common theme that it's time to talk about taxation. It's time to make the connection between what we pay in taxes and what services we get. What are the benefits that come from our taxes? <clears throat> a little bit about Dr. Himmelfar. I um, don't know if you want me to be that formal, but I am at this point. Uh, he is appointed the director of the Glendon School of Public and International Affairs at York University and the Center for Global Challenges. He has an incredibly illustrious background. Uh, he's been a professor and worked in public service. And he has, amongst those, he was the Deputy Minister of Canadian Heritage. He served as the Clerk of the Privy Council, the Secretary of the Cabinet, and was nominated as the Ambassador of Canada to the Italian Republic with concurrent accreditation for the Republic of Albania and the Republic of San Marino, and as the High Commissioner for Canada to the Republic of Malta. He's a graduate of the University of Toronto, obtained his PhD in sociology, and he works on a number of boards including the Trudeau Foundation, the World Life Fund, and Canada 2020. Uh, our panel members today, seated at the front table, are at the far end, Kaylee Thiessen, who is an economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives Ontario office, Mayor Carl Zare of the City of Kitchener, who also serves on Regional Council, and Art Sinclair, the Vice President uh, of the Greater KW Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. As can all be. Some of these names and faces are My familiar. wife asked me who in their right mind would write a book, a positive book about taxes. Now she, she had, she's kind of biased because she knows I'm not in my right mind, but, but it was clear that that was the reaction of many of our friends. One of the reasons to write the book is that taxes had become a four-letter word. What, what prompted my interest, I've been interested in taxes as a public policy person because I know that what governments do, notwithstanding the rhetoric, is they tax, they spend, and they regulate. When people accuse you of being a tax and spend this or a tax and spend that, the answer is, well, of course. 
Governments tax, they spend, and they regulate. That's what we do. The question is, do you tax enough to spend enough? Um, we're all tax and spend. So the, the impetus for this book was while I, while I was ambassador to, to Italy, <laughs> um, and I always say at every one of these meetings, if somebody offers you that gig, take it. <laughs> while I was ambassador to, to Italy from 06 to 08, the GST was cut two cents. You probably all recall that. The GST was cut two cents. That was no surprise because the conservative government had run on a cut to the GST, they promised that, and they were committed to reducing the size of government. So it was no surprise. What was the surprise was there was no pushback. There was no opposition. Nobody asked, what are we gonna give up for that tax cut? What do we lose for that tax? Do you know how much two cents of GST is worth today? $14 billion a year and growing, $14 billion a year. Do you know what the size of the surplus was when those cuts were made? $13 billion. So we were headed to recession. We were headed to deficit, I should say, before the recession. And nobody asked, what are we giving up? Nobody asked, and, and by the way, the surplus of $13 billion sends a couple of messages. Number one, it says, 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 we didn't have, at the federal level at least, a spending problem. We were spending less than we were taking in. That's what a surplus is. In fact, if we had a spending problem, the spending problem was pretty much that we weren't spending enough. Infrastructure was deteriorating. We weren't helping the provinces in need. And municipalities, the only opposition to the cut in the GST was from the Federation of Municipalities that said, give us the damn money, we know what we do with it, we have crumbling infrastructure, we have businesses leaving our community, we know what we would do with it, back a bit. You have to understand as well that that tax cut came on top of the biggest tax cut in Canadian history in the year 2000. I was in government at the time. In the year 2000, a government of a very different stripe made the, the biggest tax cut in Canadian history, right up to including the present, and the most regressive tax cut in Canadian history because the biggest cuts were in capital gains that benefit only the most wealthy. That was followed, by the way, that big tax cut in 2000, followed by the GST cut, that was followed by corporate tax cuts in the middle of a recession. What did that mean? That mean, meant we borrowed money to cut corporate taxes. We borrowed money from ordinary citizens and future generations to cut taxes. And that was on top of boutique tax breaks, boutique tax credits for parents, for the people, to put it simply, the people who needed the tax breaks least. This knows no party bias. This was a, a, an infection that was infecting all political parties at every level. Then we wanted to understand what are the consequences of this disease, because disease has taken out of us. And then we wanted to ask, how do we turn the corner? Because turn, how do we take back the future? How do we get here in short, in, in short order? The book traces it back to the neoliberal revolution in the US, the sort of Reagan, Thatcher, political revolution. It's built out of economic stagnation, rising inflation, the, the progressives losing confidence in, in, in what they were doing. This was a time ripe, and their, their answer, their answer to what ails us was that you had to focus on growth and cutting down inflation, and the best way to focus on growth was to get government out of the way. The best way to get growth was more market, less public. That's people like Milton Friedman, Friedman who's a monetarist, who's the architect. That meant, and they, they argued, that we'd overbuild government, we had to shrink it back. That was the argument. Now they had a problem, they had a problem in every jurisdiction because citizens loved the services. They liked Medicare. They liked education that was of high quality. They liked the fact that they had roads and that they could turn the tap and water would come out that they could actually drink. They liked the fact that their food wasn't killing them or only slowly. So how do you, how do you reduce government? 
when people are committed to, you know what you do? Politically, you say, tax cuts are free. When we cut taxes, they will so generate economic activity, they'll pay for themselves. That was the argument. They'll create jobs and they'll pay for themselves. Tax cuts are free. So, of course, Reagan passed on the largest deficit in human history to the successor because you know why? Tax cuts are not free. So these guys yelled at people for being tax and spend. They were tax cut and spend. And you know what's worse than tax and spend? Tax cut and spend. Because you pass on these huge deficits while you shrink the quality of programs. You actually erode quality and increase deficit. Didn't work all that well. So, so that argument, and no self-respecting economist even makes that argument anymore. And by the way, Milton Friedman never believed that. So what's the current argument? The current argument is, we'll only cut the gravy tree. We'll cut the fat. And you know, there's no organization, public, private, or in between, that doesn't have fat. There is no waste-free organization. And unfortunately, governments are really good at giving us examples of waste. We're, so we feed that argument, you know, whether it's gas plant closures, or sponsorship scandals, every government, every level, we got no problem giving them. The, the truth of the matter is that if you, and, and those are big numbers, and, they, and, they're, and we're right to be angry, and we're right to insist that governments be better and reduce waste. But if you add up those numbers, they are never a big portion of the total budget. They never fund tax cuts. They are never enough. The Parliamentary Budget Office, Kevin Page, kept yelling at the government before he got quit. <laughs> efficiencies, efficiencies will never pay for these tax cuts. Efficiencies are a good thing. Cutting waste is a good thing, but they're never enough. Here's the golden rule, inevitably and invariably, about tax cuts. They always result in cuts to services. And they always result in erosion of infrastructure. It's inevitable, it's invariable, it always happens. And, and the, I, I described the, the evil twin of tax cuts is austerity. Inevitably follows tax cuts followed by austerity. And yes, Canada is living an era of austerity. Now, it's true that austerity in Canada is not like it is in Southern Europe, or even in the UK. Ours is austerity in so slow motion, incremental, tiny, tiny drips, like, like, like an ancient torture. Just erosion, slow, undermining the infrastructure. And, our, what, and, and it's harder, therefore, to, to notice. It's also harder to generate the opposition to it that you're seeing in Europe. In, in Europe, it's violent opposition. Here, kind of, oh, I don't know, it seems okay. Why does it seem okay? Why do we say, I don't know, it seems okay? Because the first line of attack, the people who get hurt first are the most vulnerable. It's not us. We're doing okay. We got it pretty good. The most vulnerable, who are the migrants who are no longer entitled to, to, to benefits even when they pay into the EI system. Migrant workers are no longer entitled to benefits. What the hell kind of country is that? <laughs> refugee claimants that are denied in the first level of their refugee claim can't get essential medical treatment. Kids, people who are, what kind of country is that? Prisoners who are trying to remake their lives and got meager salaries while they were building furniture to try to sell. Meager salaries that they would use as they their Those salaries are gone and their fees are up. Prisoners. The, the most vulnerable, and after the most vulnerable, are the, who do we hit the most despised? Bureaucrats. Bloated bureaucrats. Fat, cat, pension bureaucrats. That's, you know, as a politician, you want to have a quick hit, big success, blame the bureaucrats. The easy target, but you know, when you're facing massive challenges like climate change and growing inequality, it'd be good to have it highly professional, capable of public service that wasn't running scared. Teachers, unions, you know, we need union bosses. And I always point out that, that, that the, the new rhetoric is not to attack union leaders, democratically elected. There are no union, there are union bosses. 
<laughs> so, so we created this sort of big divisions between unionized and non-unionized workers, public and private workers, huge divisiveness. So first consequence of austerity is meanness about the most vulnerable and divisiveness. The public issue for the next generation is rising inequality and the gap between the top 1% and the rest. The, it, it undermines trust, it undermines democracy, it undermines the opportunity of the next generation to do the simple things that we assumed were available to all of us, buy a house, save for your retirement. Both the erosion and the inequality do something profoundly scary. They erode trust. Social trust and trust in politics. And what happens when trust is eroded? Nobody wants to pay taxes. You're sitting in a gridlock in, in a traffic jam in Toronto. You've sat there for an hour. You can't get home to your grandchildren, children, spouse, partner. You're going crazy. The fumes are killing you. You got a headache. Your boss is an idiot. You just want to talk to your spouse. And you can't move. And you know what you say? Instead of saying, let's get together, pay taxes, and fix this traffic problem, you say, government doesn't work. I won't give them a damn cent. That's what distrust does. Distrust makes collective solutions to our collective problems seem impossible. It blunts the political imagination. It, when you ask people, what do you think? Should we have universal child care? People say, good idea, but how would we ever pay? Taxes. When you say, shouldn't we include home care in Medicare? People say, oh, yeah, sounds great, but how would we pay? Taxes. Build the infrastructure in your cities. You know, bridges are falling on people's heads in Montreal. Taxes. Fix the gridlock. Taxes. Invest in young people and make education affordable so the debt doesn't accumulate. Taxes. From, from 2009 to today, Taxes as a proportion of our general wealth fell four percentage points. Each percentage point is worth slightly over $18 billion. That means every year we have cut a total, only at the federal level, only at the federal level, $70 to $80 billion a year. You give me $70 to $80 billion, let me be dictator for three days, and we could do some stuff. So, we could take back the future. We could build the country. We don't have to accept decline. We don't have to accept despair. We can actually create the choices for the future, but we're going to have to confront the absolute reality of fiscal responsibility, and that is we have to pay for the future we want, and we'll get the future we're willing to pay for.